Hello. This is a video about why and how I use underexposure as one of the tools to help me control the highlights that I get from the flash when I'm photographing insects, spiders and so on. The problem is that a lot of, or some, of my subjects have very reflective surfaces. And sometimes they're curved. Worst case for a curved, shiny, reflective surface is possibly ladybird. Very difficult to use flash and avoid quite nasty highlights. I don't actually photograph many ladybirds, but I do photograph quite a lot of slugs. And they too are really difficult from the point of view of the highlights that the flash produces. Several things are mentioned by various people as to what you should do to avoid this. One of them is to use a diffuser. And I do. This is the uh, rig that I used last night to take some photos that we're going to look at later in the video. And this has a twin flash unit on it. And each of the flashes has its own diffuser. This is plastic paper, which after a lot of research um, is one of the best materials I can find for providing good diffusion without cutting down a huge amount of light. And inside, I'll take this off for the moment, we have another layer of the plastic paper and behind that there's an oval of expanded polystyrene. In addition to that, We've got this concave diffuser, and I have different sizes of these for different power of close-up lenses that I use. This is this plastic paper as well, and so that goes on here, and like that. It's fitted on with Velcro. So there's quite a bit of diffusion involved here, and I still get nasty highlights. Another thing to do with the light source is that you should make it as large as possible from the point of view of the subject. So, I mean, ideally, if you're using natural light, the source of the light is absolutely huge, it's the sky. And in order to reduce the um, intensity of the highlights, the um, the, the source of the light needs to be as big as possible. There are obviously limits to what you can do, but in this case I've got the flashes mounted quite far forward. They have to be a little way away from the con... did I say convex? If I did, sorry. Concave diffuser here. Um, otherwise you need a bit of space for the light to, to spread out. Um, but these, these are quite close to the subject. So I'm using diffusion. I'm trying to make the light source as large as I can in relation to the subject. And then there's the question of, well, you should expose it properly, shouldn't you? Um, if you want to avoid overexposure, then look at the histogram. The histogram will tell you whether you're overexposing or not. Uh, and another side of that equation is, well, if you want to expose properly, um, look at the histogram. Don't leave gaps at the top so it's underexposed. Well, I want to now have a look at a little experiment that I did earlier, which suggests to me that um, the situation is not as straightforward as that, um, and which leads me to underexpose my images 
of uh, insects and spiders and so on. Here we have a test scene and I have a manual flash on the camera so I can control how much flash power is being used and I can control it in steps of one stop at a time. I'm going to start by uh, capturing an image and at the moment the flash is set to one eighth power. So I'm going to capture an image and we can see from the histogram that that looks like the histogram of an underexposed image. There are gaps on the right hand end of the histogram. There are no blinkers on the image. All looks good. What I'm going to do now is to turn the flash power up by one stop and capture another image. And we can see that there are blinkers here. So at least part of that image is overexposed. If we look at the histogram, again, it's telling us that this is not an overexposed image. In fact, there are still gaps on the right. So from the histogram's point of view, this is an underexposed image. I'm now going to increase the flash power by another stop and capture another image and if we look at the histogram it's still not telling us that we have an overexposed image but if we have a look we can see the blink is there again slightly more I think and I have to turn the flash up to full power and take an image, capture an image. Now, if we look, we can see from here that there's lots that's overexposed in this image. And if we look at the histogram, now that is the histogram of an image which is overexposed. But at both one stop beneath this, and two stops beneath this in terms of the flash illumination there were overexposed highlights and we had to go down three stops from here in order to get an image which wasn't showing any blinkers now there may not in fact be a three stop difference because I'm shooting raw and the blinkers relate to JPEG and may be a bit conservative anyway but I'd reckon there's at least a couple of stops involved here um, so that is why I don't trust the histogram and uh, because I shoot images where um, capture images where the subject may well have a reflective element to it as with this subject so I don't believe the histogram and it's also the reason why I tend to underexpose my images by according to the camera a couple of stops or so typically so I hope I've shown why I underexpose. Then the next issue is, well, <laughs> you've got these underexposed images, how are you, how are you going to deal with them in post-processing? Um, surely they're going to be horribly noisy, um, they're going to be horrible, 
basically. You ought to expose images properly or you don't get good results. Well, let's now have a look at some examples of real world examples. These, these, are, not, these are not made up examples. These are from um, a session last night out in the garden. Um, and uh, let's have a look at several of these images and what I might do to process them. Here are three images that I'm going to work on. As you can see, they're all very dark. They're underexposed. These are not specially created oddities. These are what my images often look like out of the camera. Or certainly my images of invertebrates when they're taken using flash. With natural light photography, the story is a bit different. But I do still underexpose with natural light as well, but for slightly different reasons. I'm going to start with this woodlouse and we can see, not surprisingly, that the histogram that the histogram at the top end looks empty. Well, that may or may not mean that there's anything there. The first thing I want to do is to make this brighter. And my normal starting point these days is to use Lightroom's auto tone function. And it does indeed brighten it up. The histogram is now full at the top and the image is too bright. That's fairly typical of what Lightroom's auto tone does to my images. And I typically do what I'm going to do now which is to turn the exposure down a bit. The idea here is to get the overall brightness about where I'd like it to be when I finish it. It doesn't have to be exactly right, we can fine tune that later. What I'm now going to do before I carry on is first of all I'll crop the image a bit so that we can get a better look at what's going on. That isn't a crop that I probably use but uh, I'm just trying to make the um, subject as large as possible in the frame. The other thing that I'll do is to create a virtual copy. We're now working on the copy and the original which looks like this looks now will still be there for us to compare against in a minute or two. So I've got this bright area here and I could try just reducing the highlights. I'm going to pull the highlights right down as far as I can. Now that's not actually brought that down as far as I want. And in any case, pulling the highlights down a long way can cause problems because it can make the rest of the image look a bit flat. It's not too bad in this case. Um, and I don't necessarily mind the image being a bit darker underneath here. Um, possibly. Um, but highlights isn't going to do the job here. So what I'm going to do is to use this adjustment brush with some negative exposure and I'm just going to paint some negative exposure on the area that I'm interested in. And I can fine tune that later if I want in terms of where is being um, affected by it. Uh, I've turned it on now so that you can see in the reddish pinkish hue you can see the area concerned. I'll now turn that off so that we can see the effect of what I'm doing. And having decided where the effect is going to be I can then turn it up and down with this slider and decide how much of an effect I want. So let's perhaps have it like that. We can now compare what we've got with what we had previously. And 
I get rid of this. There we go. So on the right, we've got what the image looked like after I'd used auto tone on it and brought the exposure back down. And here is what it looks like now. Now, it may be that, for example, this is a bit dark now. So I could go back and I've got the image pretty much balanced how I want it to be. And if I wanted to make it brighter, I can, I can turn it up a bit. And I could fiddle with it in other ways if I wanted to. Um, as I said, that isn't necessarily the crop that I'd use. I'd be quite tempted to do something more like that or perhaps something a bit thinner. I quite like that aspect ratio these days. Um, so that's the first example. Here we have the second example. And I'll start in the same way as before by using the auto tone function, which again makes it look too bright, although you wouldn't think so, looking at the top end of the histogram. So I'm going to bring the exposure down. Lightroom has brought it up, by the way, by a bit over two stops. So I'm going to bring it down. Not much, because on average, yeah, I'm, I'm prepared to work with that. What I'm going to do now is there's this bright area at the front here which looks inconsistent with the lighting elsewhere. So in this case, I can turn the highlights down and that moderates it so that it's more in keeping with the rest. What it hasn't done is anything much to this area here, this brighter reflected area here. What I'll do is, again, crop a bit so that we can see what's going on. And there are a couple of things here. One is there's this bright area. Another one is there's this dark area, which might be just a fraction too dark for my liking. And I may just bring the shadows up slightly. I don't know whether this will be visible on the video or not, but, but, I, but I might do that. So I can see just a little bit more of what's happening here and here. And then we've got, <coughs> excuse me, we've got this bright area. I'll do what I did before uh, and paint some negative exposure on it. There we go, wind it down a bit. Maybe put a bit more there. There we go. Um, and that's it. That's how I might make that one look. I might leave it like that in, in terms of the crop. So that's the second example. This is the third example. And it's a bit more complicated. I'll start in the same way by using the auto tone function and we now have a couple of areas that are much too bright. Lightroom has increased the exposure by almost three stops here. I'm going to turn it down and it's sort of guesswork and judgment at this point and again we can tweak it later. That'll do for now. What I've got now is a couple of areas that are too bright and an area here which I might want to see a little bit more of. Um, and I might also want to see a bit more around there as well. What I'll do is give it a bit of an exposure increase. Just see how that goes. And maybe run around here to take the darkness off that edge. There we are. And this bit here as well that one might want to see a bit more of. Now let's look at these lighter areas. Let's start with the snail's shell. So I'll take the exposure down on that. You don't want to do it too much, otherwise you 
you kill all you flatten the image and kill all the contrast but there we go that's brighter in that area than it is elsewhere got a bit of life in it still and now let's have a go at the woodlouse and just run down that edge and maybe turn it down a bit more. Ah, there we are. And the um, this thing, this <laughs> name I've forgotten temporarily, the earwig. Uh, I think I might calm that one down a bit. Um, or some of it. Let me see. Okay. And, oh, I'd also want to get rid of that, quite possibly. Um, so we'll see if we can zap that one. Uh, that'll do. And also, it's possible that the light coming in from the top left-hand corner is, is that bit brighter. That's still looking a bit bright there on that edge of the... Um, Woodlouse. What I'll do first is um, make this make the light coming in. That's a bit too much of an effect, but just calm it down a little bit, um, and maybe draw it in. No, I think probably what I need to do is to calm. This one down some more. Yeah, there we go. Um, and I think that, well, you get the idea, you can play with these things as much as you like. Um, but it gives the idea. What we could do is to compare this with how it was um, originally. Now, of course, I forgot to take a virtual copy of it. So what we'll do in this case, let's just compare this with how it looked. If I can remember how to do it. Um, Oh, that's that. So there we go. Compare this. That's how it started. I turn that off, um, and that's how it looked now. Looks now. One of the points about this is that I've been able to bring down these areas quite happily. If I'd started with an image where these areas were a lot brighter, then I would have had great difficulty bring them down to the sort of brightness that I wanted, or that's what I, I find um, if I expose according to you know, the histogram or, 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 or make it look brighter anyway, just by looking at it on the LCD. So that's it for the third example of dealing with my underexposed images. So there we've seen what I do with my underexposed images, or the sort of things that I do with them. And earlier we saw why I'm dealing with underexposed images. And I think, like a lot of other things in photography, you need to find a balance between um, the various options and possibilities various techniques that are available to you and find out what works best for you. I hope I've shown that there's at least some logic to why in my case one of the things that I do when I'm photographing invertebrates, insects and spiders and so on using flash, I underexpose. Uh, there's another story to be told about natural light um, and uh, perhaps I'll talk about that another day. But for now, that's all. Goodbye.